Well, good morning there, Chris Hulgeth, buddy. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Absolutely, man. Thanks for having me. This is great. It's uh, quite an honor. <laughs> I, I swear, I think you you kind of read my mind like a, a few seconds before this podcast, we started recording it because I was l- literally like one of my first things I was going to ask you was like, I was hoping you would be wearing your sort of like your gear that you oh, either did your... Yeah. Your, your work in or you uh you've got this new sort of gear that you've been talking about on twitter lately so there you are but in your in your exxon mobile shirt yeah you know for me uh you know, i want this to be as good of a podcast and as uh informative and true to who i am as i possibly can and uh one of the things i would say to that is this is how i grew up Okay. So when I was a kid, we, what we would do is my dad owned the gas station. And so I look forward to it on the weekends, on Saturday mornings, I would, uh, even as a really young kid, okay. I was only in grade school and I wanted the uniform, like the rest of the guys. Okay. And so I'd, I'd go out there and I'd I'd put this uniform on and this shirt right here. This is the exact style. I went on eBay and purchased one. This is the exact style, the exact thing that I wore. And so for me, you know, some people, maybe they're comfortable in a suit. Maybe some people are comfortable in, you know, high heels or whatever it is. For me, this is where I'm comfortable. And uh, for me, I don't run for from whoever was. Okay, that's who I am. And uh, ultimately, I'm happy with who I am. And so I like it to me. It's just, you know, and I think that, you know, if there is anything that people could could uh, could take from that is, you know, there's you got a lot, you know, if you got to like yourself. Okay. And if you, you know, you got to be proud of who you are, where you came from. And again, my, my dad wore one of these shirts, right. You know, so, and I looked up to my dad and so to me, this is really cool. So I love the gear. Um, it makes me feel comfortable. It makes me feel at ease and it makes me feel at home. And so this is what I'm wearing. So I, I'm glad I didn't, because if you were expecting a suit and tie, this was not going to go well. Okay. <laughs> no, it definitely wasn't. I actually hope that it smells like, um, like gas as well. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, I, I, I hit myself with a little, you know, uh, high octane in the morning, you know, smells like smells like money to me. So I like it. <laughs> That's so classic. Yeah. Um, so I want to get on to like, you know, obviously, you know, you and your story and stuff, but but mm-hmm. maybe we could just sort of start off a little bit with the, the sort of present moments. And, you know, you kind of finding yourself as a bit of a, a celeb now on, on Twitter. Like, yeah. how does that kind of feel yeah. to you? Uh, I, first of all, I don't think that way about myself at all. I think that, uh, first and foremost, you know, I'm a, I'm a husband and I'm a dad and, uh, you know, it's hard to balance those two things when you do have that sort of presence on social media. And funny thing about it is like with the whole social media thing and the family, I had everybody in the family blocked. (laughs) Okay. When we first started this, everybody was blocked. And I think that was the power of being anonymous. So when I first started off as being anonymous, I could really let it fly. And then uh, I didn't care if it didn't, if it tanked, I was like, well, I didn't lose anything because nobody knew who I was. And if it takes off, then I can do a reveal, right? And so it really took off. Well, then one day I'm sitting there and my wife is cooking and I'm (laughs) tweeting, tweeting, okay? She goes, I know what you're doing. And I was like, what? I was like, oh God, she knows she knows I'm on Twitter, you know, uh, and she, she's, she goes, yes. And she pulls out her phone and shows that I have her blocked on, on her phone, you know, and I'm like, okay, there's an explanation for this. Okay. I swear there's an explanation for this. So she thought I was like having an affair on Twitter, you know, like I had this secret affair going on with DMs. I was like, no, it's not like that. Like this thing kind of took off and then, then it took off. And I was like, I didn't know a good time to like bring everybody into the fold of what I'm doing. And so it was really, really, it was great, man. It was, it was a highlight in our relationship. But uh, since then, they've all kind of, they've slowly been trying to, you know, they finally slowly been turning the corner going, like dad's actually doing something with this. So it's kind of, it, to me, it's just been a, this huge experiment and uh, a lot of fun. And so that's the reason I keep doing it. Uh, that's such a funny story. Um, yeah, so, so they've, they've taken it on well then, I, I assume. Yeah, they take it. They're good sports, but you have to keep in mind they also, uh, I can read the room. I think that something uh, I'm very good at is, and it really helps with Twitter, is I'm an empath. And when you're an empath, you're picking up on what's going on. 
Okay. So I can feel the room. So I kind of say, here's what Twitter is doing today. This is what the feed is looking like. And I can really digest it really well. And for the family, the same goes. If I feel like I've been on Twitter, maybe a little bit more than I should be, I know it's time to kind of unwind it. I don't want them to say, hey, dad, you know, you're ignoring us, right? So I really try to be conscious of everybody's vibes. I don't think anything of myself. Um, I'm not a guy, you know, I, I'm just a guy out here just having fun. And the more people that listen, I guess that builds celebrity. But I don't think that, you know, I'm just put my pants on like the rest of us, you know? Absolutely. And um, you mentioned balance there. Like, like, how do you find that balance with, uh, you know, running, you know, a huge company and then your family and stuff like, I think that's a big struggle for a lot of people. Uh, it's not for me. It's not a hard thing to do. Money is not first. Okay. You know, the money is yeah, like four or five, you know, first is, you know, my faith and then my family and, friends and all those things got to come first and there are times you know you'll if you watch my feed i'm real i'm on there 20 times a day and then there's times you might see me once or twice uh it's rare but i put them all first they all that stuff is first and then whatever balance of time we have left for twitter gets on twitter or youtube or whatever because youtube something i've been kind of getting into more lately i really enjoy it so I see that I witnessed this growing up with my, my, with my kids is I took notice of the dads and my kids all play sports and there's certain dads, you don't see them all year long and they're wildly successful. And then they show up at football season. And it was just a, some, an observation of mine, which was, I don't want to be that guy. Like, I don't want to be the guy who's absent. And then you just show up on special occasions. Uh, your family needs you. Uh, you know, I was a latchkey kid. You know, my parents both worked. I was taking care of myself. And, and I loved my upbringing, so I wouldn't change a thing about it. But it is, that's first. And then whatever money you make is going to be the byproduct. And I actually feel like the more focus I put on my families, the more successful I become. Yeah, it's almost got that like sort of ripple effect in, in your life, hasn't it? Like, you know, um, you probably get like a certain type of energy from being around your family and having fun with them and everything. And then like it goes and it flows into the rest of your part of your life. And you, you know, you're good in the office and, you know, I don't know, just sort of people pick, pick up what you, you know, how you are. It does. And I always feel like you get rewarded for doing the right things. And again, because money has never been the goal. Like I fall in love with things. I fall in love with my wife. I fall in love with my family. I fall in love with my job. I fell in love with my business. I fell in love with Twitter, you know, and the more I fall in love with those things, the stronger all those things become, but you know, can't, but you can't serve two masters. Like you can't be all social media without sacrificing your family and you can't be all family without doing this. So you have to, like you said, there is a balance but they need balance too. So if I'm too in their face all the time, that's not good for them either. And so they have to figure certain things out. I can't, you know, every time they fall off the bike or, you know, they get a boo-boo or they get an argument at school. Like I can't solve it. Like you have to figure some of these things out. Like you have to, I'm doing you wrong by me trying to figure these things out. So, you know, balance has never been, in fact, interesting to even say this. Uh, when my son graduated, my oldest son, I, you know, I was doing a speech for him. We went to a nice restaurant. And I did a speech for him. And I said, you know, what I want you to do, I want you to figure out how to live life in the middle. I said, because when you're, when you're in the middle, you're round. Okay. You, you know, you're, you're in the middle of the circle. It's, it's round. It rolls smooth. It goes, life is frictionless. Okay. But believe me, the more you emphasize money, the more you're going to take here. You're not round anymore. Or the more I go, hey, I'm all faith driven and I'm not relationship driven, my friends. Okay, I'm the wheel is now, it's no longer in balance. And uh, I love that you said that. And it's something that speaks to exactly who I am. If you will listen to anybody in my family, my, my mantra, my, what I live by, probably one of the number one things I do live by is I live in the middle. I could care less about being wealthy. I could care less about, 
you know, if you have too much, you, you're going to, you're going to deny things. If you have too little, you're going to do things that you shouldn't be doing to try to compensate for not having enough. So I always shoot for the middle and it, and that to me has rounded me out real well, or I'm happy. I'm very, very happy. Just one thing I wonder, like, um, you know, do, do you think people sometimes forget though? Like, like say, has that always been the case for you? Because I know obviously you, you like now you're very successful, but there's been, obviously there's been like huge, um, Absolutely. like when you've been broken, all these sort of things as well. But do you think you've kind of always been like that? Where okay, I have cool. not. No, 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 no. I, I, I worship money. Um, I thought that was the reason, you know, at all costs, at all costs, I was going to make money. I mean, it didn't matter. I did, you know, you guys have, you know, if you follow my feed, you know, I've done some things that, you know, I'm, I laugh at now. If I found out one of my kids was doing it, like there'd be a s absolute problem. Okay. I don't want any, I, I say it all the time. Don't do what I did. I'm just sharing you guys what happened, but you know, I, yeah, I definitely, yeah. My, when my priorities were not right, but it, the funny thing is the less I made that my priority, the more of it came to me. Don't ask me how that's just how it did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there's a weird way of working, Hey, and a, and a cool way of working. Um, mm -hmm. Just, uh, just finishing off maybe like the Twitter side of things, like, like what was there anything that in inspired you to, to go on there and like, you know, become this guy that shares stuff that probably most people don't even like have a clue about, you know, but like now you find so many people are really interested in, in what you are talking about. So what inspired you to do it? Well, I was reading, you know, I, I used Twitter for uh, sports. And so I would always get on there. I'd keep up on a sports nut. And then just out of nowhere, I started seeing these accounts come through that were, they were saying, you know, talking about, you know, other investments. And I thought to myself, I was like, I think I can do this. Like, this is good what they were doing, but I felt like I had a deeper understanding of what I did. Uh, number one, than what some of these other people were saying and they're, and they're great, great, great followers, but I really, I'm older. Okay. So because I'm older, I feel like I have more experience and I grew up doing it. I didn't graduate college and then start doing this. I did it from the time I was, I, I was born into this. Okay. So it's all I know. That's one. Nobody likes to talk about it with me. So I was like, when I put it out there, I was like, well, maybe we'll find some people that want to talk about it. I get maybe a hundred, 200 guys who own gas stations. But the one thing that, you know, that helps it be successful is the sheer size of our industry. Uh, our industry, we're, we're around 5%, I think, is the number of the GDP. So it's a huge number. So the total addressable market is, it's enormous. And then I knew that there would be people out there. I just didn't know how many of them were on Twitter. So I felt like the chances were high that it could do okay, but it's just being able to present the material in a way that people would be interested because I'm kind of, you know, look, you guys read again, my tweets. I don't spell the words rightly, right. I don't, I don't use correct uh, grammar. I don't, or punctuation. I just let crap fly. And I'm like, and they accept it for who I am. So it's been amazing. It's been like, a, it's been great. I've gotten better at it, you know, since I've been doing this, you know, as far as using direct, correct grammar and whatnot. So yeah, I, it's been actually a pleasant surprise. It's done as well as it has. Uh, so I'm, you know, I'm just riding with it. I don't know where it's going. You know, I've, I've gotten a lot further off of the growth, you know, saying things that are more clickbait, uh, controversial. I don't like that. Uh, I think that that doesn't last. I think it, I think it goes until it doesn't. And anytime you do something, you build a business, you build a, uh, a relationship, you have to build it off of like truths and things that really work. Then you have a strong foundation, then you build trust and people continue to use you. I have a use the exact same uh, principles I use, use in business to actually build my business using a, building my social media account. And, and it's that like authenticity and like being genuine, which for me is like almost the primary builder of trust. Mm -hmm. And there's actually almost nothing more important than trust, you know, like, in mm -hmm. human relationships, obviously in business, et cetera. So, and, and that's just, that, that's just why your account has grown because people gravitate towards, well, he's, he's talking the truth. He's a genuine bloke. He's authentic. And like, that's what people crave, you know, especially in this day and age is like so much fake rubbish out there and people pretending to be somebody they're not and faking it till they're making it. And it's mm -hmm. just like, okay, we, we, we're not stupid. Okay. We, we don't really want that anymore. We want genuine people. So I, I really, yeah, we're really grateful that that you are that person and, and leading the way with that. 
Well, I always go back to, I just have the login stuff for the account. Okay. Like I have the username and password, but it's really not my account. It's really everybody else's. And it's a, I, I try to treat it as such. Uh, my business does not have my name on my anything. I don't put my name on anything, uh, not because I, for the sake of secrecy, but it's not about me. It never has been. It's always been about uh, the business, the industry, whatever. Hey, and guys who do it, I'm, you know, I'm not throwing shade. If that's what you want to do. Then, you know, that's works for you, then go do it. But for me, uh, I felt like, or I feel very strongly that, you know, I can set the pace maybe for the day and I can put out a tweet, but there, we have such high engagement that everybody else is like, it's like a little community within the community. And it's really fun to see. And that's really what I like. That's what makes it fun. I don't want to have to carry the conversation every time. I mean, it's exhausting. Uh, but I do feel like you have a responsibility if people do re take the time to respond and reply, then the correct thing is for you to try to engage like mutual respect. Now I can't always do that because sometimes I'm short on time or I just, you know, maybe the comment is just not something I can really speak to, but I think that's what it's about. That's community building and business building. So I, there's, you know, I don't have an MBA, so you have to figure out just common sense things that work and it transcends almost every industry. Talking about not having an MBA, you speak a lot about like schooling and uh, how it actually wasn't what wasn't for you. You know, you, you say mm -hmm. that you you wasted the last five years of your life. Um, mm -hmm. Did you did you even enjoy school, or was it just like a, a bit of a waste of time? Uh, that's deep. Uh, I had a hard time in school. So, like for grade school, I was always very popular. Okay. In middle school, it, I fell off, okay? So my parents were divorced. They divorced when I was in first grade. And what happened was I was really kind of lost, okay? So I was lost. So, I, so socially, I started going the wrong way because uh, my confidence wasn't good. It just was not. And then when I got into high school, you combine my confidence was not good. It was, I was actually a very defeated person, had very low self-esteem and went to, then I couldn't grasp the concepts. Okay. So now I couldn't grasp what I was the, you know, I couldn't even rely on being like, Hey, I'm really smart. You know, maybe I'm not great looking guy, but I could, I could at least be successful at that. I was having no success in school. So if I was having no success and then I knew that I really was just like, Hey, my value really is in working at this gas station that became my identity. And here we are, the gas biz guy, you know? So it really, you know, God has a sense of humor and, um, it was, yeah, it was tough, man. Is I make no, I, I, you know, I don't want to get, you know, all welled up in the eyes or anything, but I, you know, it, it was tough times, man. No question. Uh, it's really interesting. Like a lot of the guys that I know in life that are actually really successful didn't, didn't end up going to university and, um, they kind of like finished maybe high school or didn't even finish high school. And then they just got into whatever it was like, you know, they, they learned their trade actually doing the job. And, uh, you, you, uh, from all accounts started working at the gas station, which was your dad's one. Um, mm -hmm. at pumping gas, like as a, as an attendant from, I think it was like from 3 PM to 11 PM in the evenings. I worked nights at, at first I was working day. How is it? It was like Monday through Thursday. I worked at night and then Saturday I had to work in the morning. That's when I got older, you know, when my, when I'd go to my dad's house, when my parents were divorced or so every other weekend, it'd be Saturday mornings. And then as I, when I was 16 and I was out of school, it was Monday through Thursday evening and then Saturday mornings. So what I was wondering was like, you know, you said you struggled with confidence. Did that actually help build up your confidence, you know, serving people every day? Did, did you notice that as like a byproduct at all? So I believe that for every action, there's a reaction. And I believe for whatever skills I did not have, I was hyper intuitive in something else. And I recognize that actually very early on. And so similar to, I guess, and, and I may be wrong. And if I am, somebody will be sure to point this out, but it, like, if you're blind, then maybe your sense of 
touch is better, you know, or maybe you're deaf, maybe you can see better, you know, there's all these different reactions. And, and so for me, I felt like I was really short on all these other things, but then I was really just like, you know, it was compensated for on some other things, whether it was work ethic, drive, ambition. Um, you know, I was not the most honest person growing up, but then once I figured out that that was a core to being successful as being honest, then I really, I pivoted on that and really started making a very, that's a cornerstone of the things I do now is to, you just got to be straight with people. So I, you know, you know, back on your question, you know, I feel like, you know, it all, it, it all worked out the way it was supposed to. And you said you were popular in, in like, um, uh, I, I don't know what you guys call it. Sorry. You mentioned the name, but like say primary school, that's what we call it. It's right. like, um, you were popular then. Um, mm -hmm. were you like, were you always a people person? So like, you know, we, when you're serving guys at the petrol pump, were you a people's person? Oh, yeah, very much. Uh, I've always been a people person, you know, in fact, it's funny. If you look at my two parents, uh, my dad is really, you know, just this brilliant business guy. And then my mom is this, you know, eccentric, you know, world traveler. And uh, like, I got a little bit of both. You know, not quite as good at business as my dad and not as eccentric as my mom. And I really kind of got in the, like the best pit parts of both of them. And so my mom's, you know, this great storyteller, very funny. Um, my dad, he's, you know, he's great, you know, with people too. He's very good with people, but just in a different way. And so I was able to kind of like pick the the pieces I liked and and ran with both of those. And I think that's another thing is just, you try to play to your strengths. So I would really try to play to my strengths because I was, I was good at it. But again, at, you know, when I was, when I was young and in, you know, in primary school, yeah, I was very popular. I was athletic, you know, I, you know, cause then, you know, clothes didn't matter and what hairstyle you had, none of that was important then. Then, you know, got middle school, all that stuff started changing. And I was like, I couldn't, I couldn't wear the same clothes because I grew up in a very affluent area and I was, not living in the affluent neighborhood, which is fine. Again, I wouldn't change anything. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people, they had a tough upbringing and they will go back and complain about their past, but they're like millionaires with great businesses and great families. And they're complaining, keep on bitching about their past. And you're going like all those things that happened in the past made you who you are. You need to be thankful for them because you wouldn't be who you are and where you're at right now. So I'm thankful for everything that happened. You mentioned that you grew up as a, with like a, in, in the rich area, but uh, you're almost like maybe a bit jealous of the guys and you had a, a chip on your shoulder. I think it's quite interesting. Sometimes it's those things in life, which actually really drive us, you know, and, you know, looking at your life now, you're like, maybe that did uh, drive me. 1000%. Uh, make no mistake that that is a, that was a driving factor, which made my you know, again, it got me off where I should have been, but I have done great, but I don't rub it in anybody's face. You know, I just, you know, stay in my lane, but if they want to figure out who I am and what I've accomplished, I mean, it's there, but I don't, it's not anything I would advertise, but it is a big thing. I mean, look, you know, I, in fact, I'm out now buying all these little toys I like to collect, you know, that I couldn't afford growing up. I'm in the, I'm in the market right now for this particular motorcycle. It's called a Honda MB5. And I want one of those because I could not afford one of those when I was growing up. And I'm like, I'm buying one. And I don't care if I just put it in the back of the garage, like a, a loud radio, as, as corny as this is, as, as stupid as this is. I mean, when I could finally afford it, I bought a truck and I loaded it up full of speakers and just the loudest radio because I couldn't have it when I was 16. Okay. I couldn't, I mean, everybody else had them and I was like, I couldn't afford it, you know? And I was like, I'm buying the biggest bad. I mean, you could hear my car, you know, a mile away. And that was a big thing to me, but yeah, I, now, now my kids have that. I don't have it, but yeah. So yeah, it is a big thing. It, those things, it's a gift. It's a gift. You don't realize at the time when they do, people do things that are hard to you when you're young, it is a gift uh, and it will leverage you and propel you into things, you know, and, and conversely, if you're somebody who had it made your whole life and you never had hard experiences and difficult things, you know, uh, somebody was, it was, we we're bringing it up here on something uh, uh, the other day on a Twitter uh, tweet when somebody and I were kind of going back and forth on it, which was, 
you know, you're kind of concerned about this competition, you know, from these fortune 500 companies, I'm going, listen, man, I've competed with guys who risk their lives with $200 in their pocket to come over here. And it's actually life and death. If they are successful in business, I would much rather compete with MBAs and guys who had it made their whole life than guys who, who literally, you know, uh, you know, dodging bullets on the way over. Like I, I like my chances. I, I my odds, yeah, I'm very comfortable with who my, who my new level of competition is. <laughs> You definitely had a very lively and, and interesting life and learned a lot from, from the guys you've worked with. Um, they, they, they say that uh, if you're in a town and you want to know something, you should go to the hairdresser because kind of everyone shares all the information with the hairdresser. I was wondering, does do people share more with the, the petrol pump attenders? Do you know more than the hairdressers? Uh, no, I don't think that's the case at all. The only thing now, when I owned the liquor store, yeah, you knew everything. Okay. Cause when we had the liquor store, you know, you're like, Oh, I didn't know you were, you know, you know, in the bag every night. And, you know, they, it, it, and that was a fun business because people were either having the time of their life or they were drinking their, you know, their pain away. And so you learned a lot from that. So it was, you know, polar opposite things going on, but that was a really fun business. And you did learn everything because people would come in there. They would just talk at the gas station. They would. Yeah. If you were, I would take that back. If you were working at the gas station and you were working at the cash register, you did get to hear about, you know, so-and-so's relationship and, you know, and I actually don't have a lot of time for that. So I'm like, look, <laughs> talk to this girl i'm out man like y'all figure it out and then she'll she'll give me the highlights later on <laughs> that's, that's that's interesting um you, you wrote a, a tweet and i just want to kind of read it out and i think uh, there's there, there's almost two questions around it right um okay so and, and the tweet almost answers one of the questions but but it's it'll be nice to hear it from you so you wrote things i hate to admit i dropped out i flex i made money i'm a badass i have it all right mm -hmm. what i don't have Dad, where do you where did you go on spring break? Dad, who did you go to the prom with? Dad, um, who was your homecoming date? Uh, Dad, you don't have a picture in a cap and gown. Uh, Dad, where's the picture of you in your football uh, uniform? So you said yeah. I can go on to be a billionaire. I'll never get those. Stay mm -hmm. in school, kids. Make memories, not money. Mm. So, I mean, there's you know, it's it's a hard hitting tweet, isn't it? You know, like. It is tough, man. Uh, you know, because I when I tweet, I don't ever very, very, very seldom do I schedule. Everything is kind of in the moment. So that's how I was feeling at the time. And, you know, I, it's tough because I have three kids and they know my past. Why do I have to stay in school if you didn't complete school? It's tough, dude. OK, it's tough. You live with a guy, you live in a great home, great cars, travel anywhere you want, do anything. My kids can do anything they want to do. They have, you know, as ashamed as I am to say of this, they have American Express cards, they get what they need, and then dad pays the bill, okay? And that is very tough for me because it just is. You know, I mean, like, it is, life is not about making money, man. You know, Chris, you know, how do you keep, sorry, how do you keep your kids grounded? How do I keep my kids grounded? Um, I will say with my oldest, I looked like a rock star, like I was a natural, like I should be a parent. And uh, because I was so good, my oldest one is the easiest kid. He's going to go on to be an attorney and he's autopilot. The next two are very similar to me. And it is, uh, it is a challenge. Now, they, uh, nobody really, even in my family, and, and I catch some shit about this. I don't talk about everything, you know, how we're doing financially, good or bad. Uh, my wife, and again, people can hate me all they want. It's just, this is what works at our house. She did not even know how many assets we had until COVID hit. And I said, I've got to get the will put together. You got to come down to the attorney's office and we're going to have to throw it all on the table and you get to see kind of where we're at with everything. And so what I've just always done is I've lived from a position of, Hey, we're just doing okay. Like we're just doing okay. And that's just how I do it. So I don't, while my kids have got great things, they understand. I'm very fortunate because I feel like some genetics come into play here where they understand, you know, just what, a high work ethic is now my daughter's an artist 
And it's a little bit different with her because she's more, you know, hey, what do I, how do I make money with art? You know, but she's doing her passion. I want her to do what she loves. Now, she will probably end up going to work at one of her mom's stores and, and do that because she's a natural and she can express herself through, you know, merchandising and whatnot. And my youngest one, he's very similar to me, but the piece that he has that I did not have is he has, a you know, his mom and his dad work a lot less than my mom and dad. Hey, my parents had to, I'm not, you know, mom and dad, I know you're gonna listen, but it's like, I'm not, I'm thankful it worked out the way it did. So I really think that you have to build your kids. And so I'm very invested in their lives. I'm there all the time. I'm there all the time uh, next to them. And I'm going to make sure that they see it all the way through. Uh, but I have no, no, uh, I've told them this before. We're not looking, trying to build generational wealth. It's not what I'm trying to do. I want the, I'd rather my kids know how to work than to, to drink margaritas and drive Lamborghinis. We're not doing that. That's not, that's not given back to the society, in my opinion. Hey, if you're a family officer, what you do, I'm, I'm happy for you, but that's not what I want. It says, it says a hell of a lot about you as, as a person. And um, your kids are going to be super grateful. Well, one, because, I mean, they're living a great life. They're probably going to be guaranteed a, a decent life. And But you, you're giving them these great sort of character traits, you know, you, 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 teach them about resilience and okay, cool. Life is difficult and work ethic. And, and you, 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 you get in what you put out and stuff. And, you know, that says a lot about you for someone who could just sort of sit back and go, well, you know, do what you want. Um, Good. no. And that's a big part of the platform for me is I use it as a parenting tool. Okay. Which is, I want my kids to know how to handle people. And because I've been very successful at it. I want my kids to understand the things I did. That was good. That was bad. I want my kids to, I also want them to see that I, you know, I didn't do bad that, you know, because at the end of the day to them, I'm just a goofball that, you know, makes sock puppets and, you know, burns the hamburgers. Okay. And tells stupid jokes. So for them, it's actually been very eye opening where they're going. Like we had no idea, like how, like, this guy's been living in our house all this time and he's kind of got this really kind of different kind of wit and this different kind of, you know, work ethic and drive. And, and it really is a very good parenting and teachable moment. And again, there's people who are going to go on there and say, man, you've said some things that are really crappy. My kids get my sense of humor. Okay. Like they understand if it's a joke or not really quick. And so it's very, you know, they get it. And so if somebody's going, oh, you know, you're, I put a tweet, <laughs> I put a tweet out there and this is awful. Okay. This is, this is awful. Look, we rescue animals at my house. Okay. People I make no, I have, I spent a lot of money keeping animals alive. Okay. All of my animals are rescues, but what I begrudge that veterinarians are so expensive. Okay. They're like crazy expensive. And so I told the veterinarian one time, uh, you know, they gave me the bill. I was like, look, this is unacceptable. <laughs> I was like, like $1,500 for like a couple shots and whatever. And I was like, look, at my house, there's a rule. Okay. I'm looking at this guy dead in the face. I was like, there's a rule. If the vet bill is more than what I paid for the animal, it's a complete loss. We have to total them. Okay. And it was... I would never put my dog down. Okay. Like I would never. And so it was just my way of being sarcastic with the guy going, you're too high. Okay. Like if he told me it was 5,000, I'd have paid 5,000 to get the bill fixed. I'm paying whatever it costs. I love my dogs. Uh, you know, it, but that's just kind of how I use humor to kind of, but they're like, that's sick. Okay. I'm a sick son of a bitch. Okay. I'll, I accept it. Okay. I am. But I would, at the end of the day, it's bad humor, but to me, it's humor. I think um, you would you would sort of um, fit in well in the UK, where sarcasm is basically their their only humor in many ways. So they would find that extremely extremely funny. <laughs> and well, I think sarcasm is a good sense of wit. Well, I have a large. I did do the 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 ancestry thing. I have a very large percentage of of English blood in me. So maybe that's where it comes from it's y'all's fault <laughs> classic so um 
I just want to talk a little bit about like, you know, you getting into, you know, the gas business and, and it was, I think it was 1996, uh, your dad sold 25% yeah. of his gas station to you mm -hmm. and then 75% of it to your friend, Randy. Now, yes, Randy is like such an influential person in your life. Like what was the, what, what were his main teachings for you in life, Randy? The best guy. Okay. So Randy was amazing. He was one of the very first people that my dad ever hired, maybe the first. And he just had this different approach. So when he, like he was, it was no bullshit when you're dealing with Randy. Okay. Like it is, he didn't care if you liked him. He didn't care if he didn't like him. He didn't like, he did everything the right way. By God, this is how things are. Gonna be. And Randy got crap done. Okay. At the end of the day, Randy got crap done. And this is where I really learned this whole, like, I'm not here for pleasantries. Let's, let's get the job done. And that's what Randy did. And so I really learned to handle, like my dad was really good with words, you know, and he'd be, you know, he'd tell you to kiss his ass and they'd say, thank you on their way out the door. You know, like that's how my dad was. And Randy was this guy who was like, and I'm making, guys, I'm making, I'm not exaggerating this at all. Like if you were a customer and you were not acting right, like he would threaten you with jumper cables or a tire iron or a, like get your car out of the freaking parking lot or get out, you know, you're there. I mean, we had a guy one time and this is true. So we had these in-town gas stations and this is, you just can't, you had to, seeing this stuff was just like so normal, but going back on it, you're like, I can't believe this happened. And so you would rent these, these rider trucks out and, before you rented the truck out and the customer would leave, you'd roll up the back door and you'd look to say, hey, it's clean in the back. Okay, so it's clean in the back. When you bring it back to me, I need this truck to be perfectly clean. We've, and we're gonna sign off on it. And so we had this recurring issue where you'd open the back and there'd be people sleeping in it. Okay, and you're going, hey, listen, I understand you don't have a place to live. I'm trying to be nice, but you can't sleep here. Okay, like, you just can't do this. Like, this is our business. You got to find our place. And so one day the guy had slept in the car, the, the back of the truck, just one too many times. And so Randy just goes, I mean, I can't say all the words because again, some families gonna be watching this and Randy throws off a few, few F-bombs and he gets the key and he starts up the truck, shuts the door back and the guy's in the back of the truck and Randy just hauls ass out of the parking lot, tires squealing, you know, coming out of there and the guy's beating on the side of the truck let me out, let me out, let me out. And Randy just hauls ass down, you know, like the next city down, lets the guy out. He says, I don't ever want to catch you here again. You know, problem solved. Like there, we never had a problem with the people sleeping in the trucks that we had. Like the word got around. I guess they started sleeping in someone else's trucks. He was too timid to take the approach that he needed to take. But that is how Randy was. I mean, we had people like there was one time and I've never put this story out there because I just didn't really know how to craft it, you know, to, you know, without making it too long. And so we had this check cashing booth and listen, our whole life was in that check cashing booth. Every dollar we had to our name was in that check cashing booth. And so we had, uh, so the way it was set up, you know, you walk into the gas station to the right was the cash register and that's where you sold gas and groceries. Okay. And then we were so busy. We had put another booth on the other side of the store to, you know, just set up entirely just for cashing checks. And so one day we're, you know, we're sitting there and we have this intercom system that goes through it. And our gas station was huge. Okay. It was not like a little 2000 square foot building. It was like 5,000 square feet. It was huge. And so we had an intercom system you press a button and we go, and it would like the whole building would be on alert that you're, you need somebody. And so the alert goes off and somebody says, we're being held up. We're being held up. Well, the guy went into my cash register where the clerk is that rings up the groceries, comes up to him, grabs him by the neck, has a gun to his head, okay? Has a gun to his head and is like, takes him over to the check cashing booth. He goes, give me the money, okay? Well, this is where we had that spicy Latina working, okay? Well, she wasn't giving up the money, okay? <laughs> she goes, she's looking at him going, I ain't doing it. And, he, and Monir, Monir is the cashier's name. He's going, give him the money. 
didn't give him the money. He's like, I ain't giving him money. And so uh, Randy comes in, guns blaze, and bam, 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 bam. The guy runs out the store. And, you know, I mean, that's just how we handled business. You know, he didn't shoot the guy, thank God. But uh, that's just how things were handled. And that's how Randy did things. And it was also fun, like the education I got from Randy. He taught me, like, we started going around, like, we became partners. He started taking me around and going to these different seminars, like how to invest in stocks and options and real estate and all these different, like, oddball little things. And so that was a big place where I learned all these different little, you know, with all these little workshops and got courses. And, and like, Randy was always doing, like, these crazy things. Like, you know, if he was a big gambler, like, he would play cards. He was, man, I'm going on and on about it. But that was, he was amazing. I mean, I learned a whole different side of life. And I use a lot of that. Like today, I'm like, yeah, I'm that way. In fact, before someone comes to work for me, uh, there's one rule. And I was like, you go and you talk to the other people who work here. I want you to talk to every one of them. Okay. I said, because you're going to, the hardest thing about working here is me. Okay. Because if you and I are good, you're going to be here for the rest of your life. If, if we're not good, I don't know. It's going to work out real good. So I'd rather just cut to the chase. So I'd want you to know exactly where you're coming before you, before you get here. You need to know the landscape. And so they would be required to go out there and, and every one of them will come back with the exact same thing. They go, yeah, I taught you guys. And they all said the same thing. You don't take any BS. Okay. You know, and I'm like, okay, well now, you know, so here's the deal. If you come in here, shoot me with BS, you're gone. Okay. And my turnover is among the lowest. I hardly have any turnover. And it's because I like to tell everybody the bad up front. I will tell you all the bad. I'll tell you everything is awful about here. So that way, you know, you didn't leave a good job and come here to, to walk into a bad environment. So I, everything is the truth up front. Always, always has been. Do you think you've changed a lot as like a, a boss over the years? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'll do anything for my guys. Like we're working together. Okay. But I don't come to work to be miserable. And so if I come in here and you don't do what you're supposed you're a grown man. Your parents raised you. It's not my job to raise you. You're, or you're a grown woman. That was your parents' job for you to learn how to be places on time, how to be, you know, present yourself, how to speak well with people. That's your parents' job. That's not my job. So if I've got to do all that, then this is not a, this is not a good fit. And we have no problem. I mean, it just, it, it is, a, it is amazing to me how well that works. Instead of, you know, you can't, that was the one thing we talked about I'm being manipulative. Being manipulative is, comes back to haunt you. So if I manipulate you into thinking I'm a good guy, a good place to work, then you find out now it's like, it just unravels this whole thing. You're like, look, I'll tell you I'm an ass. Now, you know, and you made that decision. So if you come to me six months from now and go, Hey man, you're a complete ass. Like I told you, you accepted that. So they, you know, and you know, but I, but like I said, there's only a few people who will say that. And it's the only people who will say that are the people who have not done right. They didn't pay me back. They, and I usually don't even say anything. They don't ping back. I'm like, just keep it. Uh, the things that get me, that triggers me is if you don't do what you said you're going to do. You told my customer you're going to be here at this time. You're not there at that time. Now I look like an idiot and I'm responsible for all these other people that work here. So that's not going to work. So that's how, you know, that's just kind of how I handle things. I think you can teach uh, many industries uh, a lot of, uh, you know, like how to handle your employees. It's almost like a, try before you buy for them you know like they, mm -hmm. they get to speak to everybody um and then you know and 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 you're like but it's not for everybody hey some people don't like the straight talking they, they just like they, they almost can't handle the truth which is which is kind of strange um so at uh, least you filter them out quickly i tell them up front i was like if this is if you're looking for a place where you need to have your hand held and someone pat you on the back every five minutes and you know this is not going to be good for you. Like, you're just not going to like it. Like, cause I don't want to, I treat people the way I want to be treated. And so I have surrounded myself with people who we all like treat each other the same way. Every now and then you, you, I'm not perfect. I'm not batting a thousand on that, but you know, overall it's, it's percentage is very high. Like I said, my turnover is like, it's like people come here to die. Like they stay here forever. Talking about like how you treat people. Um, mm -hmm. you, 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 you talk about these sort of four, ways and values that you live your life right mm -hmm. and you've written about them uh but you've also written about sort of your your ruthless side uh mm -hmm. where i think um one of the stories you wrote was there was a guy i think it was mr patel i think he was uh, trying to buy um a gas station 
and you already had one like opposite the road and then mm-hmm. he just wasn't listening to you and you're like, well, I'm just going to take you out of business and I'm going to buy another one across the road and I'm going to, you know, you're going to have to sort of, I don't know, either um, join forces or, 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 or listen to me, but there's a ruthless side to you. How do you mm-hmm. balance the value driven and the ruthless side guy out? Well, the way I put it is like he, he came into my area, you know, like I was already here and if he was already there, I'm not coming over to his area. And it's like, okay, well, that's your, that's your domain. Like, cool. There's enough. The, the thing that is weird to me, it's like, there's so much real estate and so many opportunities all over the place. And like, why are you insistent on this one thing where you're going, look, you want to go open a gas station and go do great things, then go do it. And so his goal was to put me out of business because he said as much, he said, Hey, I'm going to do this. I'm going to put a liquor store here. I'm going to do the pizza, which I had pizza and I had biscuits and I had all this stuff. And then I I was like, okay, if that's the way it's going to go, then that's the way it's going to go. And so again, for me, I have this real protector sort of mentality. And if there wasn't enough business to go around, so it was either eat or be eaten. And so, you know, people are like, you know, I I caught some hell about that one. And I'm like, I'd do it all over again. Like he came into my area, like you idiot. Like how stupid was that? Like I'm here, I've got a great thing going. And then you want to come to, okay, fine. Gloves are off. That's what we're going to do. Like, cool. You know, and so I, I hate it for him, but I mean, I, you know, it's just the way it went. I mean, it's either I was going to go bankrupt or he was going to go bankrupt. Well, I'm feeding, you know, 20 families that work in this gas station and you're just you and your wife over here. And I, I mean, I don't know, man, like that was not, that was not smart. That was not smart at all. It's yeah. I mean, it wasn't, you know, it's not like you didn't warn the book and, um, it's just, it's also interesting, like the, how, uh, you know, in an industry, you can be territorial. Uh, it almost reminds oh. you of like, like surfers and stuff. Like if you go surf in their waves in a particular beach and you're not from there, they want to fight you. And I'm like, what? <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I would probably have that a, a mentality similar to yours where I'd go, Hey, there's enough waves for everybody. They're gonna make more waves. You know, they're not gonna run out. Uh, you know, uh, it's the same way in trucking brother. It is very, very fierce in that trucking. And the part I don't like about it is like, everybody's, they're trying to get yours. And so if you're coming to get mine, then I have to be coming out here very aggressive. If you're just out there doing your own thing, I don't care, get your own customers, go get your own this, go get, but don't come into my customer's office and then discount my rate 50%. Like, that's not cool. I'm not doing that to you. I don't even have a salesman. I have no zero salesman. We do a good job. We kick ass. Word travels among the industry. If you want to go work with the, you know, the, the company that does it, the, you know, a very, very high level, call them. I give you my rate. This is my rate. You like it? We'll do it. You don't. We won't. I don't, I don't do contracts with customers because I don't want to do business with people I don't want to do business with. I want to earn the business every day. Okay. So if you're a jerk, I'm not going to work with you. I don't do a good job. Fire me. Let's go on down the road. I'm not going to be handcuffed to somebody. I don't want to do business with. I ain't doing it. I really like that approach. It's like you rely on word of mouth, but then at the mm-hmm. same time you, once you do work with somebody, it's almost like a court of kind of old school contracts. Like, okay, cool. I'm shaking your hand and, and that's what we're doing. And, and that's how we, we operate together. And I think, man, if more of the world could be like that, especially these days, Jeepers, it would, it would be a pleasure to live in. Well, it, it, it would be, and there should be a, a code of conduct among people. I know that's not the way the world works. And I know people, attorneys, and, you know, I actually had a tweet about that, which was like, um, to compensate for my lack of something, I do business with people I like, okay? And, or that I can trust. And people are like, oh, you can't do that. I'm like, okay. I have, and I can, and like, I have the body of work that says it it does work. I will never be a billionaire. That's not my goal anyway. But if that's what I got to do, 
you know, sure as hell, somebody's gonna go out there and try to cheat you. And, you know, I, unfortunately the world is full of those and you have to do it. I mean, again, a, a lease used to be a one page and now they're a hundred pages because people are looking for a way to get, you know, to beat you. And uh, I, I think that you should have, you know, my son's gonna go to school, be an attorney. Like I said earlier, I, he needs to protect all this stuff. I have leases and all that sort of stuff in place with my tenants, but I'm talking about, you know, customers that are hauling fuel for, but I, I wish we could get more of that. When I sold my business, when I sold my oil company, when he came in there, I said, here's the price. We agreed. We shook hands. I did not sign the contract till the day of closing. Till the day of closing, he spent six figures in due diligence. Um, he knew my reputation. He was like, Chris ain't going to get me. Ain't going to do it. So I was like, cool. And so I was like, the reason I'm not going to sign this is I don't know you as well as you know me. And he's a higher, you know, he has a probably morally, uh, you know, I'm in his shadow, but when we got done, I was like, I'm not going to spend money litigating, defending my business. I'm not doing it. Okay. If that means I can't sell it, fine. I'll die and go to the next guy. Like, I don't care. I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to sit here and justify whatever's in this agreement. I'm not doing it. So he went all the way through it. Everything checked out. We shook at the closing table. I signed the agreement and then he wired the money. What a great story. Um, once yeah. again, it, 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 it does say a lot about you and I hope people can kind of learn from that old st school kind of values and ways of, of just how, how to do things really. Um, hey, you're familiar with your reputation precedes you. You've heard that. I'm hundred percent. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and I don't recommend, again, I don't recommend anyone does it. I don't think anyone should do it, but I'm not going to do it your way. I'm going to do it my way. And I, I'm not trying to convince anyone to do it my way. And I'm not trying to, I won't be led to do it your way most likely either. Okay. So that, and it doesn't mean I'm right or you're right. And it's just, that's how I am. That's how I operate. That's how I operate everything. That's how I operate my life. You've lived a seriously like colorful life. You've, you've had tons of money. You've lost tons of money. You've been completely mm -hmm. broke. Um, in 2008, your mm -hmm. kids came home and their report card wasn't signed. Uh, Not how, does, how does that, how, is that what you said? It wasn't signed because it wasn't even in their backpack. So everybody their got backpack. their, so everybody went home from school with their report cards. And then my kids didn't even have a report card. How does that make you feel like when you think about that it? That is um, the toughest. That, that and my wife, you know, having to put groceries back. Okay. That was tough. Uh, the things that happened to me, I didn't care. I mean, it's just, I'm a dude and, you know, I got that alpha male mentality. Not like I'm saying I'm an alpha male, but like that, that kind of testosterone old school sort of values. I'm like, put it on me. I'll take it. Let's do it. And, uh, I, it's just who I am. I never, ever considered, you know, there was looking for another way out. Like that was never, again, I don't do it for me. I do it for them. Uh, that was, it was tough, dude, man. I mean, I make no bones about it. Cause you know, your kids, especially as my two oldest, my youngest one wasn't getting report cards then. And they, they worked hard. You know what I mean? Like they had all A's, they had perfect conduct. And so they didn't get their report card. So that was tough. Um, so those are things that, you know, that doesn't happen now, you know, like that's a priority. We'll never make sure that happens again, but the interesting part, and then it was humiliating to go to the school because then you had to walk into the school and of course you'd go pay the tuition on a Friday afternoon before they could write a check, before they could cash a check so that you could get a few bucks together on Friday afternoon, Saturday, Sunday, haul ass down to the bank Monday morning. I'll be there in a minute, you know, and that sort of a thing to cover the checks. And so then, you know, you're with all these influential families because you were doing good, you're riding high and then you're not doing good. And it was humiliating, you know, people are talking about you and that was really tough. You know, and so, I mean, I'm actually fortunate enough today that, you know, if I know somebody is not where they need to be, you know, at the school, I can make that whole. 
don't let that get out people. Okay. Like don't, uh, don't y'all are following me. Don't, don't think I'm coming to school, but those are things that I do, uh, you know, because I know how it feels. So yeah, that was really, man, that's awful. dude. It's the worst. So since being broke, like you've, you know, you obviously built your business back up. You've uh, then semi-retired uh, in 2016, then 2019, it seems like you got back in the game. There's a really cool story. And I think there's lots of lessons in it. Um, and maybe you can combine two things here. So, cause it'll probably help the story. Maybe you can, cause the story that I would like to sort of, um, sort of bring out is, is the one where you helped your drivers sort of start their own businesses as opposed to just driving for you. So like earning $1,000 a week to earning whatever it was, $10,000 a week, like you, so maybe it's worthwhile if you want just briefly saying like, okay, cool, what it is your business does and then how you help these drivers out. Okay. So in 2016, so I had three things going on. I had my oil company, which meant we sold gas to gas stations. I was, I had, was the contract holder. If you had a gas station, you bought your gas through my contract. Okay. And we had a defined period of time that we would sell them gas. I had my trucking business, which meant it was independent. So I hauled gas for my gas stations. And then I had other people who would use me to haul gas for them too. Okay. So I had trucks, gas contracts, and then real estate. In 2016, I sold my gas contracts. I was left with my trucks and my real estate. So the deal with that was I hung on to the trucks because I had just hired a guy, Cosman, to come work for me. And I said, I didn't want to put him out. He had been at his job for like, I want to say 14 years is a number that's sticking out to me. He'd been there for 14 years and leaves to come work for me. Okay. So I'm like, he comes to work for me. And I felt that responsibility to keep that going. So the deal I made, keep it going. You got a job as long as you want to making good money, doing everything we said we're going to do. I don't want to come up here. You I, I'm done. Cool. We shook on it. Then I have my real estate. Real estate is doing fine. So then for three years, those guys just managed it and ran it. And I'd go up there, you know, call it once a week, every couple of weeks, sometimes once a month. It just depended on how I felt. And I had bought a farm with the part of the proceeds from selling my business. And I was just building a pond and fishing and just I was having a great life, man. My son played football. All I did was go to his, I uh, was the director of football operations. So I'd go to his, uh, worked with his coach and bring the water and supplies. And I bought all this gear and it was a lot of, I loved it, man. I wouldn't take a second back. So then in 2019, when COVID hit, it was really a mess and you couldn't, it was coming across the news, like driver shortage, gas fuel hauling driver shortage. That's what we do. And then I could see kind of what was going on. And then, you know, one of my right-hand men had quit, got married. So I was down to one guy, Cosman, a bunch of drivers, and they were counting on me and all these customers were counting on me. And I was like, okay, well, what are we going to do? So I adopted this thing. I was like, well, I think I can figure this out. And I got a system. And so I went to, so there's two kinds of drivers. So we haul gas, gasoline, and you got really two kinds of drivers. You got drivers who work for a company and they get a W-2 paycheck, taxes withheld. And then you have contract drivers where they own their truck, my trailer, and then they pull under, they pull my customer's product. I was like, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go make all those guys. I'm going to flip them from being W-2 guys to being independent contractors, have their own truck, have their own business, enjoy the same benefits. And so I went out and I started buying these guys' trucks. And I started putting them in business. And I was like, I'll front it. You pay me back. Look, it, I, it, this was not um, mutually beneficial to me. So now they could haul, they could haul fuel for my customers. Well, next thing I know, the idea caught on like wildfire. I had drivers coming from all over the place going, hey, would you buy me a truck? Would you do this? And I was like, sure. Yeah, let's do it. And I'll buy you a truck. I'll put up, you know, 50, $100,000. And I was in a good spot, but you know, that's why, you know, cash is king. And so I had money to do it. I didn't have to borrow the money. I just got right checks and buying all this equipment, putting guys in the seats. And man, we blew up. I mean, we blew up. We, we went times like five, six, seven, I don't know when I mean, we really blew up. So 
we did. And then I built a lot of goodwill with the guys because they knew I was out for their best interest. Change their lives, man. I mean, change these guys' lives, take the best trips I've ever been on, have cool cars, live in great homes, paid for homes. I mean, you know, and I get a lot of, you know, this is one of those things where people hate on me about this. I'm like, but you don't even understand. Like, you don't, you like, you're, you want to, I know because I'm here, I see the checks, I see what they make. Yes, there is an expense with them. You know, they can only drive for me though, okay? Because it's my name, They're, the way it works in the Department of Transportation is my logos on the side of that truck, okay? So they have to, they can't, they don't have enough hours to work for anybody else. But I pay them good. We are, the way it was designed, the, play, the pay platform was to make sure it's the best place for guys, we call them independent contractors to work in the city. We, we, and we did that. I'm just the kind of the middle guy. And they let me be kind of the, vo the mouthpiece, which says, this is what the rates are going to be in Atlanta. This is what the, you know, and I, they trust me to get the best deal for them. So that's how it works. Hmm. That's super cool that you literally changing people's lives, you know, and um, once again, this is that trust, you know, that you've, you've built up with these people and uh, it's, it's incredible. And, and I'm sure it's like, they'll just like be, be serving you and, speaking well about you and and keeping that sort of commitment, which is great. Chris, just as we start sort of winding down here, I was just wondering like, what is like say one bit of advice you would give to a, a youngster looking to get into their own business? Uh, that is a really, really good question. So if you, you know, first off, I would choose something I really enjoyed doing. Uh, you know, I think it's cliche and maybe a little bit overused, which is, you know, find a job you love and you'll never work a day the rest of your life. But there is some truth into it that, you know, we are here for a finite amount of time. And a big part of that time is going to be working. And if you, you know, there's a saying in our house, which is, you know, don't ask a fish to climb a tree. So if your skill set is one that maybe you're great with people, or maybe your skill set is you're a great woodworker, or a great mechanic, or a great you're a great writer. Uh, play to your strengths. Play to the things you enjoy doing. Uh, do it for the right reasons. I think that if you don't make money the goal, and you make the process the goal, the money comes up. There is uh, something I live by, which is I go do my best job every day. Okay, do the best I can every day. And then I live with the results. Because if that's my best every day, I'm not at a, I need to be at 10 million. Because I may go to 50 million. Or I may only do 3 million, but that was the best I could do, man. Like, why am I disappointed in myself? So I would also encourage people not to take too, listen to everybody else so much. Okay. And you're going to have a lot of people, if you're going to do something great, there's going to be a, the, the risk of you doing some things that are very uncomfortable and failure are going to happen. Don't be afraid to fail. Uh, failing is, you know, it's tuition. You know, you're going to fail, you learn, you do. I've failed multiple times. Uh, so those are the things I think if you can get some of that through your head and just really kind of fall in love with what you're doing, don't, you know, tune out everybody else. I mean, who would have thought that, you know, my neighbor, her dad, he put meter power meters on the side of homes and guy went on to be the CEO of the Southern company um, and, and take pride in what you're doing. So if you do a good job, like you really do a really, really good job, man, the results will take care of itself. So, and be, and the last thing is to be honest. There's the last thing. If you, if you don't do it for the right intentions and you're, you know, and you're not honest with, it's just money. Like, I screwed you. I messed up this product. It's a thousand dollars. Here's the thousand dollars. Do it, pay it, get on with it, live it, you know, and then you can go on down and you can uh, live to see another day. So, those are really the things, if you can get those, you get your head around those things, it, I swear to you, the rest takes care of itself. And it's really cool because like so many of those are almost just soft skills, you know, it's not, not like even say technical knowledge and stuff. It's like the soft skills, which kind of actually get you, get you far and build the trust and all those sort of things. They're free. They're free. Uh, you know, it, it, it speaks to who you are and 
Yeah, no, no degree required. Love it. And Chris, if, if people want to sort of find out a bit more about you, what's the best way for them to, to follow you? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm real, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not real salesy, but, you know, I am on Twitter and it's gas underscore B-I-Z. So G-A-S underscore B-I-Z uh, is the Twitter. That's where you'll find me the most. I'm on there a lot. I don't respond to people as much as I'd like to on DMs. It's just, it's just as the account has gotten larger, it's just hard to do that. Uh, I am on YouTube, which I'm really, really enjoying that. I just feel like there's a a better path there. And so it's gas biz guy, G A S B I Z G U I. So I'm on there just starting to, you know, some people learn better through reading it. Some people learn better if they get to see a video. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to start putting two videos a week is the goal. So it's, uh, I'll be reporting from the gas cave here. So you can, you know, these are my props and what I do. And we're always trying to bring value. And then last thing, if you need it, you can always email me at info, I-N-F-O at gasbiz.net. So that's the, if you can't get me there, you're not going to find me anywhere. Okay. <laughs> Classic. And then uh, the last question is, uh, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Ridiculously, I think that means being your true self. Okay. And so when you're ridiculously human, which means if you're, if you're given 100% of who you are, your, you know, your, your character, your, what you do for fun, uh, cause we are, are all human and we're all flesh and that is being hundred percent of yourself. That's amazing. Uh, Chris, listen, buddy, I just wanted to say what a cool bloke you are, right. And, um, it's, uh, lot. it's been an absolute pleasure. Just like chatting to you uh you know we we didn't really speak much about what it is that you do but you know because you really do speak a lot about that and you've been on a great podcast that speaks a lot about that too but mm -hmm. bringing out this sort of like other side and the lessons and the advice and everything has been you know like a real human elements is has just been great and i think people are just going to learn so much like people don't even realize you know definitely not through this conversation is like how successful you are. And I think that's another thing that says a lot about you is like just being truly humble. And mm. that's a, a great trait to carry. Doesn't matter how well you ever do in society, just just keep being yourself, keep being humble. And, uh, and that's the way to go through life. So thanks, buddy. It's been an amazing conversation. I appreciate you. It giving has, man. I have, I have really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Uh, Hope to do some more of these again. So if you ever uh, have a big gap in the calendar and you need to, to waste some time, okay, look me up, okay? <laughs> Thanks so much, bud.